everyone. Welcome again to the Doomer Optimism Podcast. Today we have Sean Chamberlain. Uh, if you're familiar with dark optimism or survive in the future, uh, this is your man. Uh, I want to say, even before I let you introduce yourself, Sean, that in many ways I see Doomer, Optimiz Doomer Optimism is kind of an American version. Maybe you could say an American knockoff of dark optimism. <laughs> you came first, a uh, very similar term. And so maybe we're just kind of following in your footsteps, but we're doing kind of the American version of that, uh, which, you know, has some differences, of course. Uh, so that'll be fun to get into at some point. But uh, why don't you go ahead and start, start with a little bit of your background, your overall kind of diagnosis about society and what you've been working on for like the last decade that, you know, in response to your diagnosis. Wow, that's a lot of things to say. Um, okay, <laughs> well, my background, um... Where to begin? I mean, I guess 2000 was a big wake up call for me. In the year 2000, we had um, uh, basically truckers blockaded oil refineries in the UK and um, all the petrol stations ran out of fuel, the gas stations ran out of fuel. And um, yeah, it was a real eye opener for me on the kind of dependency that we have on, on oil. Um, and that was kind of where my journey started on like looking into um, the fragility of global civilization and climate and energy and all of the great poly crisis that we're facing um mm -hmm. and uh sort of was doing that informally in my spare time for a few years and then 2005 quit my job i was at that time running a a learning center for marginalized groups so working with drug misusers and people with mental health issues and young asylum seekers um and i kind of got to the point where i felt like you know, that work was essentially kind of helping marginalized groups reintegrate with society. And I was like, but society itself seems to be running off a cliff. And I just want to engage with that in some way. But I had no peer group, no kind of sense of what made sense. I looked at what, you know, big NGOs were doing and it didn't really speak to me. Um, so basically, I learned to live really cheaply. I quit my job. Um yeah learn to live cheaply so that I didn't have to sell my hours so that I could give my time to my to my passions uh moved back in with my mom at the time down in southwest London um and for about a year was just kind of researching stuff like harassing interesting seeming people etc mm -hmm. uh and then I uh found this place called Schumacher College which you might have heard of down in the southwest of England and uh there was taught by David Fleming and Rob Hopkins and Richard Heinberg, among others. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, really found felt like I'd found a peer group. Um, and so it was sort of 2005 that I was sort of in on the, just as the Transition Towns movement idea was coming together, co-founded Transition Town Kingston in Southwest London, wrote the second book of, of the transition movement, and also started working with David Fleming um for what turned out to be the last sort of five years of his life um brought lean logic and surviving the future to publication after his death mm -hmm. um was also involved with the origins of well not quite the origins but the very early days of the extinction rebellion was one of the first arrestees of, uh under that banner um and then where i'm sitting right now is the happy pig which is our kind of um little community on the west coast of Ireland uh, where we run a kind of gift economy community we have a, a hostel where people can come and stay for free um, and uh, yeah a living kind of small holding communal life here um, oh and I guess the other thing I should mention is um, now partnering with Sterling College in Vermont on these courses on um, this sort of community called uh, surviving the future conversations for our time and that's just, that's my sort of online home now um, where people can kind of come and, and, and join the wider conversation about what we're all doing. And yeah, I guess the second part of your question was my diagnosis. And I think I'm quite aligned with David Fleming in that, uh, you know, I mean, he was decades ahead of me. So, you know, he was involved in starting the, the sort of ecology and Green Party in this country back in the 70s. Um, and by the kind of 90s, it got to the point of thinking, well, gosh, you know, we're we're spending all this time talking about the ecologically sane decisions we should be making, but nobody's listening. And frankly, the mainstream isn't going to listen because there's too much political and economic and social 
momentum behind kind of economic growth and all of that. Uh, and so really, even back then, sort of, what, 30 years ago, uh, he came to the point of, well, in that case, I'm bored of just banging my head against the wall of advocating for sanity that isn't going to get listened. So what does it make sense to do as society churns on towards collapsing under the weight of its own unsustainability, really? And that's that's kind of where my my work continues to be placed. Um, I, I used to be I used to work with David Fleming on kind of um, sort of policy advocacy and stuff. Um, and really, I've largely lost interest in that now. Um, that's where my kind of peer reviewed work was in kind of climate policy. But there's only so many ways scientists can say, look, we really, really urgently need to reduce emissions yeah. um, before you kind of think, well, there are reasons this isn't happening. OK, um, so, yeah, that's probably my overview. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's quite a background. Um, and yeah, I mean, you've contributed a lot of a lot to the world already intellectually in terms in this space. And I think, uh, you know, in a very valuable way to the Doomer Optimism crowd as well, who, you know, encourage them to, to look into your work. Um, I'm always curious about theories, theories of change now. Um, so, you know, a lot of us in Doomer Optimism kind of, you know, it's Doomer because we basically, uh, you know, agree with your diagnosis that we're heading towards various kinds of collapses. Um, most of us generally don't see kind of a one apocalyptic day, right? Uh, it's, sure. it's more of like, it's not equally distributed across geography and across time. Uh, it's just, you know, our life support systems gradually, you know, in various shocks uh, becoming less and less viable. Uh, and like what you said of like, there's, so there's a couple of different axes of theories of change. One is like, do you try and reform the system, you know, you know, engage policy, or do you try and create parallel systems? Do you try and basically prefigure what's going to come after, right? And it's hard to like be a purist about this. You know, we all have to, to some degree, live in the world, right? You know, at least speaking for myself uh, and most people I know, we're all kind of compromised in various ways, uh, whether it's how we make a living or whatever that happens to be. Um, let me just like jump right in. Like, how do you see this playing out in terms of like say the next three decades? Um, you know, it's hard to predict the future, of course, and what exactly shocks will happen when and where and what the ripple effects will be. But do you see this as a gradual process or do you see this kind of as prepping for judgment day, so to speak? Uh, well, on that last point, I think I'm with you. It's uh, well, maybe somewhere between the two. I think it's a gradual process, but it's a process with lurches. Yeah. Um, you know, there are sort of crisis moments and everything seems like it's all falling apart tomorrow and then things tend to calm down a bit. Um, you know, John Michael Greer talks about catabolic collapse, the system yeah. sort of gradually eating parts of itself. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, very much that kind of perspective. And one of our um, co-owners here of, of the, the Happy Pig is um, Venezuelan and mm -hmm. um, first connected with her through these Surviving the Future Conversations for Our Time programs. And one of the things that's really brought home to me, I mean, you kind of touched on it. I, I love the line from William Gibson, the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Yeah. Um, and one of the beauties of that kind of online community, um, I mean, I'm broadly not a fan of online, yeah, uh, generally. But one of the beauties of that is that it allows a kind of time travel. Um, you know, like if you're talking to people for whom collapse is very much a lived reality now, um, and they're talking to you and going, oh, wow, you're still in that period where you're talking about like, oh, when's it going to happen, you know? Yeah um and uh and so that yeah really brings home that we're not kind of on a global scale i don't think we're so much heading towards collapse as living in it you know we're not sort of standing on the tracks waiting for the collapse train to hit us you yeah. know in some ways it's reassuring to think well you know we're we're living in it there will be lurches it will get more difficult in some way um but it's not this crazy unknown world that we have to prepare for it's actually about moving today in more resilient directions and for me you know you talked about the compromises we all face in our lives um and that's absolutely spot on um and for me really the the absolute key thing that has helped me in my movements towards i don't know feeling in right relation to this stuff is 
moving more and more of my life out of the financial economy and into the relational economy, the gift economy, the informal economy, whatever words you want to put on it. Um, and, you know, the less money I need, mm -hmm. um, the less money I spend, the less I need to sell my hours in one way or another, and the less I need to compromise. And um, and I, it very quickly becomes obvious, whatever sphere you do that in, that, um, you know, learning to do things without money mm -hmm. um, keeps you pretty busy. And so, you know, you end up you end up giving your time to that instead of giving your time to a job. But it's it's a heck of a lot more satisfying, in my opinion, uh, yeah. and my experience. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, that's part of the ethos behind what we've created here is that it's a place where people can come and just be like outside of that need to sell your time or your labor or your products just in order to have a place to exist, you know, to pay the rent or pay a mortgage. Um, this is a place where you can come and stay and, and, and remember what it is to exist outside of it. We sometimes talk about having having bought this land out of the market economy in the same way that families would buy their families out of slavery. Um, and that seems really key uh, to me in doing that, not only for those reasons, but also, of course, because we're kind of trained by mainstream society to look for our security and money, you know, our savings or our pension or whatever it may be. Um, and then, you know, you talk to Marcella about her experience in Venezuela, and she knows very well that the security that money gives can evaporate um, and that it's just not a good place to look for that, whereas yeah. relationships Mm -hmm. both with with humans and with the natural world tend to have a bit more sticking power yeah yeah i kind of um you know when people are talking about retirement plans and stuff you know for me i you know i, I can't really take it seriously uh hmm. it, you know i kind of think of my retirement plan is you know the skills that i'm building the productive physical assets that i'm developing the relationship and community i'm building um the chest the chestnut trees i'm planting the right. soil I'm building, you know, all of these things is kind of like my retirement plan. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see how that plays out. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about lean logic and surviving the future. You know, mm -hmm. what what do you see as some of the, you know, necessary skills, uh, both to, and it's interesting too, it's a side note that Often in these spaces, what we suggest people do, you know, is actually a better way to live. It's, you know, it's closer, more closely aligned to the good life, but it's also preparing for, you know, you know, the collapse of current systems. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, it's a response. We say resilience, but it's also like, no, we're actually, but we're actually creating. It's not to me. I don't like the prepper mentality. You know, I like, no, actually we're. We're actually prefiguring a better way to live and it just happens to be more resilient as well. Um, but it's also more right. meaningful. Um, but you know, going back to my question, you know, in terms of like what what essential skills do individuals and families and communities, you know, recommend developing? And this could be physical skills, this could be relational skills, um, whatever they happen to be. Uh, do you wanna do you wanna kind of walk through, you know, some of some of what you've recommended in in your writings? Sure. I mean, maybe the first thing I'll say, having just talked about uh, the importance of getting outside the monetary economy, is that when I talk about uh, these books, people are used to being told, you know, and go out and buy them. And uh, I want to make really clear that Lean Logic is completely free in its entirety online um, mm -hmm. at leanlogic.online. So you can everything I'm talking about is is made completely freely accessible in a gift economy way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, yeah, as as I kind of hinted at there i mean i think the 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 first set of skills really are relational i think um yeah. you know there's there's definitely this instinct um around prepping that it's quite it's either you know you on your own or you and your family on your own um and uh and definitely one of the impulses behind the origins of the transition town movement was uh rob hopkins kind of looking at that and you know ev everyone else he could find online who was concerned about collapse type issues was all you know hunker down and get tinned food and a shotgun mm -hmm. and um and he was like well I, I don't want to do that that isn't how I want to live like my question is um how can we respond to this communally how can we respond to this um you know if someone turns up on my doorstep starving uh how do I try and 
make sure there's more food to feed them with rather than how do I shoot them effectively. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so that's um, the ideal. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that well, speaking for myself and most of the people I know, I think we were raised in cultures that um, are deeply kind of individualistic and atomizing and again taught us that the way to meet our needs is is financial. Um, and yeah, the process of learning to live in a less financially dependent way is usually the process of learning to relate to people better um you know it's for me it's been a lot of kind of activist communities that i've been involved with and have stayed with um it could also be family it can be friends it can be um you know coming together to create a cooperative i was i used to chair a thing called the ecological land cooperative which um exists to remove the barriers to to land for people who want to live in these kind of ways and is 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 now kind of expanding around the uk has uh, seven sites now um and so yeah for me the first thing is look at what it would look like to live in a way that's less dependent on money mm -hmm. um and then that will sort of lead you into the skills that you need mm -hmm. um because then you'll find again it, it it's so much about relating um and then when you when you've got those relationships then you start looking more into the kind of uh infrastructural needs you know then it's like um well, I mean, I, I spent some time in kind of uh, squatting culture. I'm not sure how that translates in the US. I don't know how the laws differ and how the practicalities are. Mm -hmm. I know I know some people in that scene in the US, but um, I, I quit flying back in uh, 2002, so I've never been to the US. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and so, you know, in that context, like you'd find yourself living in this in this space in a in a non-monetary way um but of course you're always facing that threat of kind of eviction um and you you know you create something really beautiful with a group of people but there's always this kind of transience to it and that led us quite naturally into um the ecological land cooperative work because then it's like well how can we create something this beautiful in a way that you know can be sustained that isn't isn't sort of torn down by by the powers that be um and then you start thinking well the only way that's going to be really resilient if it is if it's based around um you know growing food and and um creating shelter in a way that doesn't destroy the local ecosystem and all of this stuff um so yeah it's kind of all flowed from there but i think the um the first answer to your question would be yeah start by exploring what it looks like to to meet your needs through yeah. relating rather than through money yeah well, speaking of relating, I mean, so one thing that comes up a lot in Doomer Optimism is that there's a lot of people dissatisfied with the status quo of society, um, and they have different reasons for it. So there's a lot of Doomers out here, um, but their their diagnosis is pretty different, right? So there's definitely the biophysical Doomers, energy, ecology, climate, uh, etc. Um, and then there's like more of like the political economy you know monetary policy various things like that um and what we find and what we run into in this space is that there's also you know we, we meet a lot of people who are like yeah this the status quo is not going to last let's talk about you know building alternatives but then we quickly find that there are really deep-rooted cultural differences right and people coming, you know, because the diagnosis is different, uh, you know, maybe it's technocracy that they're worried about, right? Mm -hmm. Techno, you know, if you're more of a lefty, it's techno capital. If you're more of a right winger, it's more WEF kind of, you know, global, mm -hmm. you know, government domination or something like that, right? Um, and you find that a lot of cultural differences, especially say among more urban people and among more rural people, uh, among more lefties, among more conservatives, or even reactionaries, uh, you know, we've had a lot of conflict in the space of, you know, Twitter is a is a is a really kind of a shit show um, because mm -hmm. everyone likes to fight on Twitter. Uh, I like to think on the podcast we 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 have a diversity of perspectives come on, and they're very nice, good, exploratory, civil conversations. Um, but I, I'm wondering in your context. 
you know, how you run into cultural differences. You know, you can th think more more left or more conservative or more urban or more rural or other axes as well. And and how how have you navigate have you navigated those things? Yeah. Um well I suppose first of all by not trying to think in terms of those axes actually. Yeah. Um I mean I think I mean left and right in particular I find such an unhelpful concept. Um you know the very idea that all our beliefs about life could literally be put on a one dimensional spectrum yeah. <laughs> and that then yeah. on that one dimensional spectrum we're actually really only talking about left and right as though they're two individual points on one one dimensional spectrum mm. it's just so explicitly designed for conflict generation you know yeah. let, let's let's divide ourselves into two tribes which none of us can fit into that comfortably because they're completely mm. one dimensional and then shout at each other yeah. and you know honestly from this perspective when i look at u.s discourse mm -hmm. it's astonishing how polarizing it is um yeah. i mean i remember when u.s politics was first sort of getting to grips with climate change in a serious way mm -hmm. um and just being astonished to see how there was this sort of period for a while where they couldn't quite decide and then eventually they resolved oh okay this side is for it and this side's against it. <laughs> you know as if that's obviously the way you deal with any issue right. and then right. you know oh there's a deadly pandemic okay well this side thinks it's real and this side thinks it's not and yeah. it's just it's 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 surreal, honestly. And um, and as with most things culturally, what I find is that, um, well, the UK is a little bit behind America, but tends to adopt most of the madnesses that America adopts. And then Ireland. You're, tends well, to yeah, follow yeah, you're on welcome. For that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. And and so for me, you know, so much of it is about well a not spending much time on twitter because i think that's also designed to be quite a polarizing context yeah. um but then actually having conversations with people um you know like the the categories of kind of collapse nicks that you just described i mean i feel um fully on board with all of those concerns you know fully on board with like techno capitalism fears and critiques fully on board with world economic forum fears and critiques mm -hmm. fully on board with biophysical like yeah. disasters coming i mean all of these things um yeah. make perfect sense to me and i think for me like one of the um uh, one of the challenges of the at least the lip service that we pay to kind of science and logic because of course all the climate scientists will tell you that this culture doesn't care at all about science and is just mm. ignoring it completely but nonetheless we we like to think of ourselves as rational scientific <laughs> thinkers anyway um and I think one of the challenges of that is that very appropriately, the scientific method will take a hypothesis or an idea and will try and find the thing that's wrong with it, because mm -hmm. that's how you improve, right? You find the thing that's wrong with it and you put it right and then you've got a, a better hypothesis. Yeah. And actually, I think that's probably infected too much of our discourse. And what I find is a lot more useful when I'm talking to somebody is to look for what's right in what they're saying instead of looking for what's wrong in what they're saying. Mm. So, like, look at what someone's saying that seems to me to be a you know wildly different perspective to my own, and go, huh, what's right in yeah. what they're saying that can then inform and update my views rather than what's wrong in their point of view so that I can update their views. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. I find like that that starting point, that perspective, mm. um flows through in a massive way um to relationships like if you find the thing that you agree on and mm. you start discussing the thing that you agree on and you try and learn something yourself from that well then you've got that sort of grounding of like oh okay yeah you know we've got a respectful conversation here and then if you do come onto something else where like maybe you just disagree on the I don't know the facts of climate science for example yeah. well then you've kind of got a basis of mutual respect from which to go okay well if we apply what we said there then you know yeah. why are we seeing this so differently mm. um and so yeah for me it's that it's 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 finding finding what we agree on rather than finding what we disagree on and yeah. in practice um yeah that's that's led me to find far more far more allies than i've got time to explore that allegiance as far as i'd like and every so often you know especially online you get you know the 
oh god i used to spend way too much time sort of debating climate deniers online mm-hmm. and i remember getting to the point where um uh, there was a particular graph and I was literally saying, well, look, so this graph shows this, so blah, blah, blah. And the person I was talking to didn't sort of challenge the validity of the data or, um, you know, uh, suggest a different hypothesis. They just disagreed as to what the graph actually showed. Like, no, it doesn't show 750, (laughs) you know? And I was like, wow, if we can't even agree on literally reading the measurement yeah. on this graph yeah. and why on earth am i giving my time to this you know wow. it's the it's that classic meme of no i can't come to bed darling someone's wrong on the internet yeah. um you know we, yeah. we we've got better things to do with our time right. so there is there is a, a point at which you know if someone's just not up for a collaborative conversation then mm-hmm. move on for sure but in general um yeah i i haven't really found too much problem with those rifts and and the kinds of people who've wanted to get involved in the kinds of you know collaborative ecological projects that i've involved with over the last 15 years or so um yeah there's the usual interpersonal challenges but but in many ways that's all as i say part of developing developing skills of a kind of um of a future that's less dependent on money yeah Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I find a couple, you mentioned, you know, let's just say climate skeptics. Um, mm. there's a couple points of common ground. Uh, one is I'll say, you know, well, and, and they, they point this out and I think they have, they have some insight here is that it's very hard to, you know, climate change projections are, are very fraught because it's such a complex adaptive system. Uh, it's very hard to predict you know, what the, say, average global mean temperature will be in 10 years, let alone any particular region, you know, all of the, you know, impacts of the jet stream. And, you know, there's just so many factors. So it's like, okay, yeah, it it is very hard to predict. But, you know, we can look at historical data, we can say that, okay, the global mean temperature is, is, is rising, you know, Um, we can say that, uh, many of the things that, you know, whether, you know, you know, whether it's true or not, many of the things that we would want to do in response to it, um, would be things that you would, you would be amenable to, right? It's like more Mm -hmm. localized food production, right? Uh, A lot of kind of more conservative, uh, and even reactionary are getting on board with that. And, and the second, you know, and this relates to the second thing that there's common ground is that a lot of them, are waking up to ecological crisis, right? They're still skeptical mm-hmm. of climate because they, they don't trust the, it's more of an epi- epistemic issue, right? They, they, mm-hmm. they don't trust the intentions of, you know, that narrative, uh, the people who are putting out that narrative, but they recognize that there's chemical pollution causing a lot of different health impacts, you know, getting into our water supplies, uh, getting into our air. Uh, they recognize topsoil loss, uh, they recognize biodiversity loss. Um, they many recognize, you know, energy precarity, and you mm-hmm. know um, that we might be moving into lower density energy future. Uh, that we probably are, uh, and so all of these things, you know, uh, and and then I would agree that some points in the narrative, there's kind of a a carbon myo- myopia where like everything environmental gets reduced down to climate now or, or carbon in the yeah. atmosphere. And, oh, God, yeah. you know, and I just say, well, I, you know, I do, you know, I'm not a climate change skeptic. I see it happening, but it's part of a much larger picture of really planetary overshoot, you know, ecological overshoot and yeah. energy, you know, and basically, you know, energy collapse, catabolic collapse, and you know it's it requires full spectrum regeneration, and what full spectrum regeneration looks like uh, is actually something that many people from many different ideological backgrounds can get on board with. It means you know more robust community life. It means you know more localized food production. You know more people working with their hands in you know actual physical tasks. Um, you know, it, it, I would say it, 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 you know, it, it means better, you know, less alienation, you know, less being subject to the whims of the, you know, global capitalism. And, you know, mm-hmm. perhaps they have a trigger with the word capitalism because they interpret that differently, but it's like, okay, commodification, right? Like there's always ways to like reframe things in, in ways that people are like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. There is some common ground there. Um, yeah. 
so that's that's helpful um it doesn't it doesn't get all the way there but as you said like you know the the kind of the uh futility of arguing online you know at, at a certain point you just have to be like okay well you know if we're close to each other what projects can we can we collaborate on right like like what yeah. what actual practical things can we do that we both agree with where some of these ideological differences don't even really matter right and so that's that's a good way in and that's you know in doom or optimism we try and encourage i mean i kind of see it as a cosmo local network where you know we're trying we're using the internet which is kind of ironic um we don't know if the internet will be available forever but mm -hmm. right now we're using the internet to help people wherever they are localized but we're also in a network you know where we're supporting each other mutual aid you know solidarity you know information you know uh uh you know innovation diffusion all of these things that that are actually very helpful to do at a national and a wider regional and a global scale a planetary scale yeah. Um, and yeah, if you live in New England and we don't agree on the details of climate science, like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if, if, if you're, if you recognize, you know, that we need to, you know, ecological regeneration, we need to revive, you know, healthy community life, then that doesn't, that, that's not as important because that will help address climate change, you know, adaptation anyway. And also it's implicit localization is implicit degrowth. You know, you're you're less mm -hmm. very narrow economic sense. You're less efficient uh, because you're not getting these economies of scale and gains from trade. But you know, your life is more meaningful, and you're probably using less material throughput in a linear economy, mm -hmm. right? And so that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean that the the climate thing is unnecessary. Is basically what you're saying, and I completely agree. Like, you, if if you get all the other elements of of overshoot. And yeah. you don't you, you don't agree on climate it doesn't really matter as you say i mean i often think you know there's so much focus on energy supply you know it's like the the mainstream approach to climate is oh well we'll just replace fossil fuels with renewables right and everything right. can just carry on as normal yeah. um but of course you know you look at that and you think well say we tomorrow discovered some incredible energy source with no carbon emissions and was unlimited mm -hmm. you know cold fusion in a teacup yeah. um you do not suddenly have sustainability you know yeah. you have you have the growth overshoot machine going into overdrive because it's got even yeah. more energy to play with and all the problems continue to accelerate except for climate so as you say and and i, I what there's a there's a, a quote from kirkpatrick sale um that i think really beautifully sums up this kind of common point of view that as you say mo most people in this area are really on board with um because I, I don't know if it has the same currency over there, but over here people often talk about the simple life um, mm. in the sense, you know, the good life, the small holding, all of that. And Kurt Patrick Sale wrote, um, actually, I wish to complexify, not simplify. It's our modern economy that is simple. Whole nations given over to a single crop, cities to a single industry, farms to a single culture, factories to a single product, people to a single job, jobs to a single motion motion to a single purpose human organizations are healthy and they survive when they are diverse and differentiated capable of many responses they become brittle and inadaptable and prey to any changing conditions when they are uniform and specialized it is when an individual is able to take on many jobs learn many skills live many roles that growth and fullness of character inhabit the soul it is when a society complexifies and mixes when it develops the multiplicity of ways of caring for itself, that it becomes textured and enriched. Mm -hmm. And I find like that kind of reframing that actually, you know, we've got this incredibly complicated society, but it actually makes people's lives in this sense really simple, mm -hmm. um, really brings home something about the the complexity and joy of of living in a way that's that's less dependent on those systems. Yeah. One way I've framed it before, it, you know, people often say, oh, so you, you want to get off, like, you know, live off the land, live the simple life. Um, and actually, I say, I reframe it, it's that actually, in many ways, it's much more complex because you have yeah. to, first of all, you have to be more of a jack of all trades, minimum viable capabilities in many different areas, or in a community where you have some division of, of labor that can help it out, but, but less division of labor, less specialization than mainstream society. Uh, so it's more com complex and you actually have to internalize 
both individually and as a community, internalize a lot of that complexity that you know is, is currently distributed over the whole global you know capitalist system, right? Yeah. And yeah, you have to internalize that complexity, and that you know that's hard. You know, oftentimes it's frustrating, especially if you grew up in a in the American context, in a suburban context, or an urban context where you might not you know have really known where a lot of your food was coming from or a lot of just your basic life support systems you know how they showed up at your front door uh it can be frustrating and hard but it's it's also very gratifying especially if you're in a context in the community where you know you have mentors uh and you know um you you have just a positive reinforcement for you know the, the progress you are making um yeah and if your life in the city felt both follow and and subject to the collapse of huge systems that you have no control over yeah this is a this is just a side uh kind of a tangent here but i am kind of curious so we've had we recently had uh chris mage on the podcast again mm. and as I you know, chris, yeah. as you know he's re recently written a counter to george mombio's regenesis mm -hmm. um well one i want to ask you what's happened to george mombio uh why has he become such an eco-modernist? Um, why does he think that we're going to grow all of our food uh, using precision, precision fermentation and vats, you know, with energy from solar panels? Uh, everyone's going to move to the city. Um, I used to read George Mombio in college. Um, he was great, you know, voice of kind of the anti-globalization left back in the day, talking about, you know, neo-colonialism and all of these things yep. and now he's picking fights with vandana shiva and mm -hmm. others right like how do you interpret let, let me let me phrase this kind of couple ways how do you inter interpret his trajectory and what does his trajectory say about kind of this larger kind of you know let's just say kind of the liberal kind of left of center eco-modernist move where yeah, actually, we are going to transition to renewable, to green energy, uh, quote unquote, green energy, and kind of maintain our current lifestyles, et cetera. Like, 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 how do you see that that psychological and cultural transformation happening in him? And what does that reflect about the larger cultural conversation? Yeah, I think it's a very important thing that it reflects about the larger cultural conversation. So, George, I I know, um, I don't know him well. We're not we're not good friends, um, but we get on and mm -hmm. known each other for some time. Um, I absolutely do not know him well enough to speak for him in any way at all and want to make that absolutely clear. Um, and I haven't spoken to him about this. So, yeah, just want to make that clear. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Chris, I know very well. I, I, I was the commissioning editor for the Small Farm Future book that he brought out um, a while back, which I think is an amazing book. Um, yeah. sure it's very influential in, in Doomer Optimism. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, from my perspective, and again, I stress, like I absolutely do not speak for George in any way at all, um, nor, have I, nor have I been following his work super closely recently basically because it's gone in a very different direction to my own um but all of that said all those caveats offered um to me it's it's an example of what i call environmentalist favorite argument um and to me environmentalist favorite argument we've heard all of us so many times you'll have on the one hand um one environmentalist saying look everything's incredibly urgent like we don't have time for revolution. We don't have time for radical change. We've just got to operate within the systems we've got now because everything's just so urgent. And we, you know, see that examples, of that argument across every field of discussion. And on the other hand, you'll have someone saying, well, no, you're wrong. We do need radical fundamental change because if we don't have that, we're, we're just addressing symptoms and we're not addressing the underlying cause. And we need to absolutely radically fundamentally change things. Otherwise, you know, we're toast. And, you know, I'm sure you can immediately think of 30 examples of that argument from every different field yeah. of environmentalism. Mm -hmm. And for me, the reason that argument is never resolved is because they're both right. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's true that things are overwhelmingly urgent and it's true that we need fundamental radical change. Mm -hmm. So we need fundamental radical, fundamental radical change and we don't have time for it. I think both of these things are true. 
Yeah. Um, and for me, the interesting conversation starts where that one ends. It's like, well, what happens if we acknowledge that both of those things are true and yeah. that actually, you know, really, you know, we're into kind of collapse type scenarios. But to my eyes, um, what we're seeing with this kind of Monbiot shift and, and other people I could name um, is kind of, you know, they've started off. Well, I don't want to talk about George specifically because I don't feel I can speak to him. But I think a lot of people have started off, um, you know, arguing and campaigning and fighting for what they really want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and have now got to the point of like, well, this isn't working. <laughs> you know, we're not we're not getting it. Yeah. Um, so we need to pivot. You know, we need to we need to um, like there's no way that from a point point of you know the 10 billion people we're supposed to have on the planet in a few decades time mm. um that kind of uh small scale localized living is a real challenge when you've suddenly got you know 10 times as many people on the planet as you did previously and maybe that isn't actually feasible and so maybe that isn't really something we should be arguing for anymore because then it feels like we're arguing for you know something that's going to lead to the deaths of billions of people um consequently we need to look for something else and maybe something like eco-modernism is the the least worst option given where we are now mm. um because i absolutely do not accept that george has you know been paid loads of money by big mm. corporations to start you know being a corporate shell like i i know his integrity a lot a lot more than that um so uh so yeah from my point of view it's this kind of environmentalist favorite argument where it's like people are unwilling to go to the place of mm. well if that's true and that's true then we're headed for collapse because mm. for completely understandable reasons mm. um you know they're like well any option is better than collapse and the death potentially the deaths of billions of people and that's a very understandable perspective and again my starting point when talking to people is always let's let me try and find where they're right instead of just pointing at where they're wrong and and you know hammering it yeah. um and and from that perspective i i can find that position quite understandable um but i think it's mistaken because um desirable as it might be might be to avoid collapse um i think it's where we're headed and i i don't think there's there's anything to be done about that at this point and so you end up in a very different conversation mm. if you're saying well okay we're headed to collapse what do we do to make it less bad than it would otherwise be yeah. than if your question is how do we sustain 10 billion people on the planet with minimal ecological damage which i think is where george is coming from yeah okay that's so so you're not questioning his motivations you, you're really questioning kind of his his analysis um you understand where he's coming from why he's coming from even though you don't agree with it and that that's kind of um that's kind of smage's approach as well like it's not a character attack um mm -hmm. but he he does go through you know he does counter mambio's numbers say on the energy requirements material requirements for this and you know according to smage you know he 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 debunks them you know with his numbers right of course mm -hmm. all numbers all empirical analysis can be you know is, is subject to critique of course um and, and he's he's also welcomed critique of his his analysis um yeah that's interesting yeah, but in a way I, I in a way a more... what's that i want to make a quick note i don't know i, I said earlier like why is he picking fights with don shiva i don't know if he's actually picked those fights i know that Bandana Shiva is highly critical of, of his approach. I don't know if he's picked fights with her. I just want to clarify that um, just, just for the record. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, so another thing that comes I, up. I about... just, I just, one Go thing ahead. I'd say on that is that um, I'm not massively interested in, you know, let's debate the, you know, the facts and figures of, of what's feasible. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm not is because actually, um, I don't know if you know Paul King's North's work, but he's a friend of ours who lives locally, yeah. and um, he came over last uh, the night before last for um, for some Guinness and some chess. And uh, um, yeah, we were we were chatting about uh, Leopold Kor, who had this famous dictum that um, where anything is where anything wherever anything is broken, something is too big. Yeah. Um, and he wrote this very beautiful book all about 
scale and um you know very similar idea to, to david fleming's dictum that large-scale problems do not require large-scale solutions they require small-scale solutions within large-scale frameworks mm-hmm. um and you know wrote this really really gorgeous book and then he has this chapter near the end uh which is called something like will it happen mm-hmm. and the chapter just says no <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's the thing like uh, i don't see that even if we did prove that it's theoretically possible for the whole world to live a small farm future or for the whole world to become eco-modernist neither of these things is going to happen and so i have limited patience for the fine detail of what's feasible Mm -hmm. in that sense um and much more interest in you know it's interesting if the winner of that debate then has a huge influence on millions of people and, and has a material impact on things for sure. Um, but for me, it's, it's so much more about, um, you know, how do, how do we actually want to live once we've taken that, that context into account? Um, which, yeah, which actually leads quite quickly into kind of what you might call deeper kind of spiritual type questions, but I don't know whether yeah. that's where you want to go with it. So, I'll yeah, well, I mean, so, so Smage, so how he organizes his book, saying no to a farm, to a, saying, uh, saying no to a farm free future is he, he spends the first half of the book, you know, presenting his own counter empirical analysis. Like I have saying, even if, even if Monbiot was true on the numbers, it still wouldn't be a good idea. And he gets into all of the more of the spiritual and quality of life and, mm-hmm. and, and, and other, and other issues. Um, it's interesting. Well, now, now you piqued my curiosity, you know, with Paul Kings North, you know, I followed his work a little bit, not too deeply. Um, I know that he's become deeply religious, um, you know, a little bit more reactionary as well. Um, you know, talking about kind of the machine and using language that appeals to kind of more the reactionary side in, 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 in U.S. politics. I'm curious. OK, so so I've asked you how Mambio's trajectory kind of what that says about larger society. Can you say, can you just answer the same thing about King's North's directory? <laughs> well, he and he and George were actually old friends going way back. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's been interesting to watch uh, them go in very different directions. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Paul, um, you know, he and, and Dougal Tyne uh, co-founded the Dark Mountain movement back in around 2009, I think. We've had Dougal um, on a couple of times. So, okay, We've great. We've had Dougal on a couple of times, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and you know, that's something that was, um, again, something I was involved with and, and you know, a huge fan of. Um, and, uh, you know, so Paul's kind of perspective is, well, gosh, it's like 15 years now I've been writing about um, how this whole thing is is going to fall apart under the weight of its own unsustainability and all the you know this is our last big chance to save the world Mm -hmm. stuff is just you know not worth buying into um and he's kind of you know laid out his um case for what's going on and a kind of more of a mythic register if you like um you know more looking at like what's 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 going on from from that perspective um and yeah, in terms of what it makes sense to do, I mean, from his point of view, it's um, yeah. How does it make sense to live in in relation to this? Um, and he, you know, Mark, who who lives here with me, um, Mark Boyle, he was known as the moneyless man. He he quit money for three years um, and is now living without electricity. So he's not just off grid because nobody could tell him how you can make a solar panel without an industrial society. And nobody could tell him how you can have an industrial society without destroying the ecology. So um, so he decided until they did, he's going to give up electricity and, and really get to know his local biosphere. And um by a region and um uh and so you know i would say that paul is interested in the spectrum between uh mark's kind of uh just kind of stepping away from it all you know just saying right actually i want no part of this and i don't think i can fix it and you know he often gets accused of um 
you know, surely you should be out there trying to shift the culture and change things rather than just, you know, stepping back, which, of course, he does to an extent because he's a writer himself uh, and wrote a beautiful book called The Way Home, Tales from a Life Without Technology. Um, but Paul's very interested in the kind of spectrum between between that and um, uh, a more kind of engaged resistance, if you like. Um, you know, like, you know, Paul himself lives in a, you know, an Irish country home, but a conventional home with electricity and running water and, and you know, a family. And um, uh, and yeah, he's really interested from a kind of spiritual perspective in um, you know, what it what it looks like to live in a in a loving and, and true and beautiful way in this context and, and far less in the questions of um you know what should society as a whole do um which i think all of us feel um that society as a whole ain't, ain't going to pay all that much attention <laughs> to uh to to what 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 the likes of us think um and consequently um i guess unlike chris and george we are more about um yeah, what it makes sense to do kind of locally and communally and um rather than rather than that um right so you know, just let, me, conversation. let me jump in this is kind of backtracking a little bit maybe tie it all together um so there uh, yeah on the one hand all of these kind of debates you know in these spaces you could say esoteric debates you know might not really matter because you know mainstream society has a certain inertia um that's kind of the capitalist realism thing um and breakdowns are going to happen and we're going to respond or not and you know that will be that um at the same time you know that there is there you know there are potentially real stakes in these disagreements you know for example in george Monbiot's case you know basically advocating i think i, I think according to chris mage like 90% of the population in cities uh, mm -hmm. for various reasons. Um, what that would imply would be basically forced relocalization, right? It, it would be kind of a new enclosure instead of, instead of, you know, for, you know, for, for people to develop the land, you know, capitalists develop the land and say, you know, a few hundred years ago in, in, in Britain, it would be for like rewilding or something, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. a thing, but but essentially, it would be taking people off the land and you know having them make a living in the city. And so then we're talking about well, you know, we can't really affect it, so let's try try and find a way to have a low impact, more communal kind of setting, probably in a more kind of rural setting. Well, those two visions might actually start to clash, and real power dynamics might start to come in. And I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah. Um, you know, the voices I'm really interested to hear from are the voices of people who've lived in cultures that have a track record of existing for millennia, tens of millennia, um, you know, which we tend to clump under this indigenous worldviews banner. Um, but to me, you know, th this whole culture that George and Chris and I and everyone else was raised in, um depending on where you measure from it's been around two or three hundred years and it's already undermining the very basis of life on earth um and you know probably the people who've lived in that aren't actually the ones with the the insights needed here and, and when i speak with people of various indigenous backgrounds one thing they seem really really um in agreement on is that this very concept of wilderness is problematic. Yeah. Um, this very idea that you have like the human world and the wild, natural, pristine world is is an error. Um, you know, there's a there's an amazing book um, called Tending the Wild, um, which is all about you know collecting indigenous perspectives around this. Um, and they're like, you know, human beings are, are as much part of natural ecosystems as all the other creatures you i mean you don't get you know marmosets going oh we should probably not disrupt that bit of nature and you know leave it pristine it doesn't make any sense yeah 
Um, and so to me, the idea that you take all the humans and put them in cities away from nature, what you're going to do is create, if that were even feasible, what, what would happen is that you'd create a huge number of humans who have no understanding with or affinity with nature at all. Mm -hmm. um, and no sense of what it is to coexist with the natural world. Um, and the idea that politically they're going to see the essential importance of not breaking out of these enclaves that they've put into and, you know, stepping out into the wider world, it seems quite culturally naive, um, let it, setting aside all the, you know, questions of physics and food yields and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, to me, yeah, the, the, the wisdom that we need on, on ways, ways of living as human beings that actually endure, um, are, are indigenous and, and, you know, I, I would say that Chris's perspective is, is a heck of a lot closer to, um, indigenous life paths than, uh, than George's yeah yeah no that's i think that's an important point that we bring up a lot is is this idea that well i mean there's there's kind of two sides right so modern day at least in the united states modern day agrarian culture is basically completely dependent on industrial civilization right it's high energy rural living and that's yeah. uh, and i think oftentimes there's a confusion of like when people advocate for kind of agrarian or, or re-agrarian uh regrandization he's saying oh so you just want kind of more people you know living out kind of you know using more resources because it's less efficient it's less dense so more fossil fuels to get their goods where they need to go and all the roads and infrastructure and power lines and all these things and 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 that's not i think what any of us are advocating for so on mm -hmm. one side it's like humans like rewilding in some ways that the where rewilding needs to happen is humans need to rewild again right like they right. were actually part of the wild there's plenty of as you mentioned there's plenty of evidence that humans have been you know co-evolving with their landscapes for you know hundreds of thousands of years at least um yeah and when and when europeans first got to the the new world that you're living in yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like, oh, my God, look at the natural abundance. It's just overwhelming. Of course, yeah. that wasn't just. Yeah, it was a highly developed by humans. Course, that, was, that was that was that yeah. was you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so and so there's kind of some confusions on both sides where I think Monbiot perspective is leading more towards humans are just never going to be good for for wilderness. And so we just need to separate them from wilderness. Um, and, you know, then this other perspective is, no, we actually humans need to rewild themselves not high energy industrial you know agrarianism but actually mm -hmm. you know degrowth agrarianism basically um mm -hmm. what, it, what it amounts to um you know with you know and chris does a good job in his new book talking about there, there are inevitable trade-offs between human livelihoods and uh other other species right other you know other creatures and those are trade-offs that sometimes are very difficult trade-offs to make and but they're inevitable right um but it's you know like if you're well, every predator prey relationship demonstrates that exactly well. right yeah. like humans are going to disrupt the niches of other creatures but in some cases they might be good for certain creatures other cases not so good for other creatures and you manage those trade-offs the best you can but saying that you're going to separate humans from all of that and support let's just say support eight billion people in in the cities through you know what accounts to eco-modernist magic the thing you know that that's not actually going to be <laughs> incredibly uh extractive uh you know outside of the field of vision of most people is incredibly mm -hmm. naive. uh it's incredibly nice yeah and and you know you talk about um this idea that you know humans can't exist in 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 relationship with the natural world so we need to separate them off i mean one of my real sort of bugbears one of the things i've sort of made it a bit of a mission to challenge everywhere i see it is this idea um which spreads more and more that like you know during the pandemic it was it was kind of you know humans are the virus right you know we're the ones who are destroying everything and i really want to challenge the idea that humans are intrinsically problematic it's not humanity it's this culture 
Mm. You know, there's a there's a other human cultures have existed perfectly well for many millennia without devastation. You know, again, when when the Europeans arrived on the coast of New World, when as one indigenous elder described it to me, we found Columbus floating off our shore. Mm. Um, you know, the indigenous Americans weren't there going, oh, thank God, someone's arrived to save us from the ecological destruction we brought on this continent. Yeah. But that's kind of what our culture is like. We're like, oh, well, hopefully the aliens will come and take us off to another planet where we haven't ruined everything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's so important because I think people are literally killing themselves because of this idea that humans are inherently destructive, evil beings, you know, mm -hmm. and that, well, I'm a human. Oh, my God it's not humans it's the culture and the culture is something we can reject and it's something that we can resist and ultimately it's something that we can change yeah um and you know that i think is is absolutely critical and if you look at you know this question you're talking about of you know trade-offs between you know the well-being of predator and prey or the well-being of a farmer and local ecosystem or whatever it may be again i look to indigenous cultures and they have this very simple principle which is not sort of um you know, vegetarian or more veganism, this, which I think can often be an expression of that same sense of, well, I just don't want to touch that because it's yeah. it's beautiful and I don't want to disrupt it. Um, but instead, their principle is you can kill an individual, but in so doing, you take on responsibility for the well-being of the community of that individual. So, you know, if you catch a salmon, you take on responsibility for the well-being of that that salmon spawning ground and that river and everything that those salmon need to continue in a healthy way. Um, and I think, again, this is a cultural thing, not a human thing. Um, and I think culturally, if we saw that responsibility, that it's not, you know, by by uprooting a particular plant or killing a particular animal individual we're intrinsically harming it but that we look to the ecological well-being of that community you know it's it's very easy to see how that leads to a to a very different way of being to to anything that we can see from where we are and and i think also when you talked about kind of industrial agriculture and um sort of traditional small-scale agriculture it's really important to remember that despite all the marketing um, to the contrary, small farms still produce most of the world's food. Right. You know, industrial agriculture is is still in the minority. You know, we're constantly being told, like, we need industrial agriculture to feed the world. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's very well established, as I'm sure you know, that um, industrial agriculture produces far less food per acre. It mm -hmm. just it produces more food per farmer because they're using all this fossil fuel energy and these tractors and everything else, mm -hmm. um, but far less food per acre. So if we're really talking about, um, you know, a farming system, as, as Chris lays out very beautifully in his work, you know, if we're really talking about a, a system that's good for the ecology and, and feeds more people, yeah. um, then there's absolutely no reason that I see, at least, um, why it should be divorced from the wider ecology. Yeah, I mean that's a the, getting into food systems and agroecology versus industrial ag is, is a complex conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, and I, and I on that Chris is Chris is far more. Um, yeah, I would I, I would certainly I would I certainly say that um, when people say that industrial agriculture is more efficient, usually what they're meaning is labor efficiency. You yeah. know, getting people off the farm, you know, switching to machines and, and yeah. inputs, which is absolutely um, true. And there's no doubt that switched back to agroecology would mean would be more labor intensive, meaning you need a lot more farmers and you need a lot more kind of, and that can also include urban agriculture as well. It's not purely a rural thing. I um, mean, there is a wrinkle there that some people yeah. talk about, you know, pre-industrial agriculture was super labor intensive. Yeah. Industrial agriculture is super energy intensive. Yeah. Post-industrial agriculture could, in theory, be design intensive, you know, like permaculture, food forest, agroforestry type systems. Yeah. Um, you know, there is the potential there. But as, as Chris explores, you're never going to get that kind of utopia of uh, massive yields, you know, yeah. no labor. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, even though I mean, there's no I think, you know, it's an interesting question whether we would have to go back to say 90% of the population directly involved with food production, or if we could downshift it to like 10 or 20%, which is still much more in the United States, it's like 1% now, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, it seems like ideally it would be, we could get it to like 10 or 20%, um, where it's it's more design intensive, 
Um, it's definitely a lot more people producing food. Um, perhaps some kind of appropriate tech is involved there too that, that assists with that. Um, on the point about smaller scale farms producing more food, I mean, it's, it's complicated. So like, you know, if you look at it from the point of view of commodity crops, like there's no doubt that corn yields, for example, in the United States have skyrocketed in the last century because of petro fertilizers. Right. Mm -hmm. And but then you have to ask the question of like, well, where are a lot of these corn yields going? Well, they're going to the ethanol industry, which is a complete boondoggle and, and you know, it's been shown just to be a complete just waste of energy and time um, and ecologically devastating. Uh, or it goes to feed livestock in concentrated feeding operations, as well as like soybeans and cutting down rainforest to grow soybeans to feed to cattle and concentrated you know, livestock operations. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, so like, I, I guess, you know, talking about having an argument about farm size and yields and farm method and yields is a, is a complicated conversation, but I think it's too limiting on a conversation. It's not holistic enough because right. you have to look into, again, you're not just looking at energy or labor or climate emissions or, you know, you also have to look at biodiversity, you have to look at uh, at soil, you have to look at community health. Um, and if you take all of these kind of things to account, a wide boundary analysis, then it becomes really interesting where you can have, you know, hopefully a really productive conversation about what are the trade-offs in different contexts, you know, about, okay, like, you know, how much in a particular context, you know, animals can be, a, and you, you know, absolutely are an integral part of the you know, the operation, let, let's just say, um, because they recycle nutrients, uh, they provide, you know, uh, some critical nutrition, um, you know, as we see from peasant farming all over the world, but they also don't eat a lot of meat, right? It's the, the meat consumption itself is much less than the Western industrial diet, for mm -hmm. example, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's important to kind of get into, start getting into these nuances uh, about these things. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, as as I said before, for me, that starts to get into that whole conversation about, you know, I don't know, what should global agriculture look like, um, which to me is a lot less interesting than bringing it back to a more a more kind of personal scale. Um, you know, like so much of this surviving the future conversations for our time work is, you know, meeting people where they're at and working out you know you talked about the kind of the compromises inherent in kind of striving towards particular ideals but there's also something really important i think about starting at the other end starting at like where we're at now and you know what um what steps can we take to move forward i mean vandana shiva was actually one of our one of our guests on this year's um deeper dive and uh i i really liked what she said when someone was like yeah you know i understand all that stuff but like if there's one thing i can do from you know living in suburbia what would it be? And and her answer was grow some of your own food or know who does, you know, like yeah. that's for her, the kind of the way in is just yeah. like, know where it's coming from. Yeah. I mean, as in terms of like a broad scale political platform, minimum viable, you know, kind of collaboration, that's a pretty good place to start, you know, like yeah. people from all different ideological, you know, perspectives can can get on board with that except for the neoliberals who are like that's inefficient blah, blah, blah. right um but for, you know for everybody else uh how, how efficient can it possibly be to destabilize the life support systems of yeah, the planet like yeah, exactly. you know you might need to think about your definition of efficiency if that's efficient. right yeah. yeah i mean then they'd be like well we just internalize the externality da, 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 put it in the market yeah. price and it's like well has that ever actually happened <laughs> do you have any analysis of regulatory capture and and yeah. you know all of that. Anyway, yeah, we we agree on that. Um, well, perhaps you'll in, indulge me a little bit. So, so from what you've observed from kind of the doomer optimist scene, you know, like like what is your perception of it? Is you know, uh, you know, as a you know, as a person from the other side of the pond, uh, mm. and kind of the themes that we emphasize, you know, and critiques that you might have as well. I'm curious about kind of you know your perspective on what we're doing, how it kind of follows in the footsteps of what you all have, have created and yeah i'm curious about how you how you see what we're doing uh huge solidarity um is is my overriding feeling um you know i first encountered it, uh, ashley colby i think reached out to me and invited me to teach on one of the courses she was running and 
Um, you know, I think what's happening there is, you know, our, our surviving the future conversations for our time is is a is a purely online um, mm -hmm. program. Although often the participants get together if they happen to be geographically near each other. Um, but the way that she's combining that with, you know, on the ground, like let's get together and 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 actually do some dirty handed stuff. Yeah. um you know i think is 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 fabulous and and there really isn't anything that i've kind of gone oh you know bit bit uncomfortable with that or you know i think they could rethink this part um you know it just it feels like um yeah like people who've just had a lot of the same ideas and are, are running with them and and um yeah no i'm i'm very much um yeah, just very much feeling a sense of, of um, comradeship and solidarity and, and really glad to see it um, bubbling away. Nice. Um, yeah, I'm curious, uh, it, it, you know, hopefully, you know, there can be collaboration and more collaboration in the future. And I, I'm wondering, you know, do you see any scope for collaboration of like, let's just say dark optimism and, and doomer optimism? world mm -hmm. you know and i know it's much more nuanced and complex you're involved with a lot of different initiatives but um yeah and and also you know there's different somewhat different sensibilities you know i think the Amer you know uh what would you say like like i was attempted to say uk but but you're you're not in uk you're in yeah, I mean, in general, I personally sort of between the UK and Ireland, um, yeah. you know, I, I grew up in the UK and um, a lot of my networks, my family are there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of I, I don't fly, as I mentioned, so I'm back and forth on the ferry quite a lot. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah. And and so, it, it, you know, so that I, I think that there's, you know, definitely a room for, you know, I, I really, you know, it's it, I've never been I've never been to the UK or, you know, I'm 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 like half, you know, a mixture of English and Scots Irish and and Welsh, but I've never been there. Um, I don't really know, you know, know my family back there. But I, I I really do appreciate the sensibility and kind of what all of you, you know, this whole scene that you've been a part of has brought to the table. Um, and it would be interesting to see in the future, like how, you know, how we can collaborate more practically, but also kind of these sensibilities kind of mixing and co-informing each other. Yeah. What do you do? You have thoughts about that? Well, I'm I'm totally up for up for more collaboration for sure. i um, very much enjoyed my my participation on on that course with Ashley and the conversation we've been having. Um, I mean, it strikes me that part of it might just be, um, you know, if if there are if there are offerings that we're putting out there, um, then making sure that they're networked. You know, making sure yeah. that. Um, you know, I mean, there's loads of people on my Surviving the Future courses in the US, for example, um, and maybe there are particular Duber Optimism kind of events or offerings that um, we could be promoting and just kind of cross cross pollinating and, and you know, making sure that because I think, again, like I can't stress enough how much this this line changed my life um, when I when I met David Fleming at the time, I was really thinking like, wow, climate is huge, you know, maybe I should go and get involved with the United Nations negotiations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this line from him absolutely brought me up short, you know, large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. Yeah. They require large scale solutions within large scale frameworks. Mm -hmm. And well, really all of, say again? You said large scale solutions within large scale frameworks. And I think you meant- Oh, sorry, small scale frameworks. solutions within yeah. large scale frameworks. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, and, you know, all of all of my work since then, when I look at it now, has has really been about those things you know like the ecological land cooperative is about providing a framework that allows individual people to get on the land and do a diversity of things that are appropriate to their diverse places mm -hmm. um you know transition towns is about creating a large-scale framework that enables local communities to figure out what they want to do mm -hmm. and it strikes me that you know um there could be yeah there could be more connections between our respective networks either side of the pond um because inevitably there'll be people over here who come into contact with doom or optimism in one way or another and people over there who come into contact with dark optimism in one way or another and just making sure that those um kind of frameworks are are, are linked and networked and yeah um yeah just supporting each other however we can yeah nice nice all right well yeah well um 
yeah, we'll keep that in mind. And and I definitely recommend Doomer Optimus, um, Doomer Optimus checking out uh, your courses and your work. Uh, before we wrap up today, um, are there any questions that you wished I, wished I had asked? Any any things that are the cutting edge of your your heart and soul right now? Any anything? Any any other topics you want to explore? Huh. Um. Oh, I mean, there's. I mean, you know, we we kind of mentioned uh, lean logic, but didn't get into it all that much. Um, and for me, that's a a really beautiful touchstone in um in the work that we're put on um the work that we're undertaking um you know the kind of i think quite often you can get this kind of critique that um okay fine so what you're doing is more enjoyable and you think it's more resilient but it's all a bit quaint isn't it and you know it's it's all a bit like backward looking and um you know progress is charging on in the opposite direction um and uh Actually, on that, I really love um, Mark, who lives here uh, in his book. He had this line about um, techno utopians are always warning us to be careful not to romanticize the past. Yeah. Uh, and he wrote on this. I agree. And I know it firsthand, the bloody mucky realities of land based life. But be even more careful of those who romanticize the future. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, for me, Lean Logic has this amazing way of taking that kind of, oh, it's all just a bit quaint and and turning it on its head and being like well actually all of the older cultures um that have not destroyed their land base and destroyed their ecosystem and indeed destroyed the economic and cultural bases of their co continued existence have actually been based in the things we miss have been based in music and play and culture and fun and you know yeah enjoying life together um is actually the thing that's bound communities together in the absence of economic growth and its attendant certainty of collapse mm -hmm. um and so i guess there's um you know there's that kind of broader um underpinning which i find really um really adds resolve you know to to, to my work because i feel like yeah this is playing a small part in um the emergence of what i see as likely the post-collapse economies of the future um as, as david writes the uh the sequel to our troubled civilization mm -hmm. um and for me a lot of the work is around that kind of pre-figuring um and then the other thing is yeah this this kind of online community that's grown out of that the conversations for our time community which um is yeah it's something I'm i'm really um really thrilled about it was the thing that you know when we started it in 2000 i really wasn't sure whether whether it would catch you know um and now to have this really uh sustaining group um who are kind of talking about all these things and have like a broadly shared perspective and are doing our different work literally on every continent on earth and we had a we had a, a research scientist from Antarctica join us last year. So we, we completed the set of continental participation. Um, and uh, yeah, that feels um, quite kind of exciting edge stuff for me at the moment is that that kind of, as I say, that time travel possibility of, of having yeah. collaborators who are kind of already living in futures that maybe, you know, might be coming to the likes of where we live. Yeah. I love I love that line that you mentioned earlier about you know also don't romanticize the future. That's that's great. You, you can add a number of things here, like reframings that I think are really helpful. Uh, you know, when when we run into a lot of the you know the critics, and it's important to take the critics seriously and and to evaluate our own positions. And I think you know, yeah, I really appreciate how you you know how you reframe things, how you you know you open up space to kind of think about things differently. And I think that's that's beautiful. Um, one last thing I'll, I'll mention is, you know, as you might, might or might not know, we kind of operate as a collective in, in a way where we have, you know, we've had, I think I counted the other day, we have, we've had 30 different hosts of the Doomer Optimism podcast and 15 of them more than once. And, you know, maybe we have like six or seven kind of, I would say, core hosts who've done multiple, multiple interviews. Uh, but we really encourage, especially, you know, people who we've, who we've interviewed and and seem to really um, vibe with uh, to, you know, if you ever want to use this platform to initiate, you know, a conversation that you're really interested in with somebody or a panel of people that, you know, you think would be a really 
beautiful conversation or really helpful conversation. Mm. I just want to offer that that if you ever want to be a host on Doomer Optimism, uh, you're more than you're more than welcome, and you could do it individually or get one of us, you know, me or Ashley or somebody else as the co-host. Uh, but we're that's that's kind of our our growth strategy is basically to <laughs> make it you know available to as many people to find, take ownership of the project themselves. Um, awesome. So just want to throw that out there. Um, if there's any conversations you want to have and you think Doom Optimism is a good platform to do it, uh, just let me know. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. That might might be a good, uh, yeah, collaboration, cross-pollination type thing like we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Cool. All, all right. Um, well, um, anything else before we wrap up? No, I mean, I'll just mention my website is darkoptimism.org. So, you know, there's links there to information about the happy pick here and the courses and the books and lean logic right. online and all of that stuff okay. um and that'll, all be, no, show, that'll be, all be in the show notes as well so people can follow up with that great but no it's been a real pleasure jason and um yeah. yeah i mean for me like what it all comes down to is telling a story that we're proud to tell with our days um yeah. i mean I've, I've actually i've just been reading um i don't know if you know the book but it's called man's search for meaning by victor frankel uh and it was I've heard of it yeah i haven't read it myself yeah there's like a guy who lived through the nazi concentration camps at auschwitz yeah. and dachau and you know because so much of my work um is around people who are feeling quite despairing about you know the state of the world today and particularly the state of things ecologically and culturally and um and economically and uh you know i thought it'd be a really interesting read um because i'm like well you know if someone can can live in literally in a nazi concentration camp not in the usual hyperbolic sense that people use the word nazi online um then um and still find meaning and purpose there then yeah. the things that held true in that context um you know might be applicable to someone who's living today and and feeling right. despair and and really you know i'd say that that is what it's come down to um in that book as well is you know as long as you got something that you can feel you can work towards and improve and um are telling i think nietzsche said um if someone has a sufficient why they can put up with almost any how mm. um yeah. and uh and yeah for me that's what it's about it's not like um getting too hooked up on intellectually you know what makes sense to do because i've myself kind of gone down paths in my life that i kind of intellectually convinced myself of and then found my enthusiasm lacking and waning and becoming quite burned right. out um it's much more about like creating more space in the world for the the kind of future you want to see and you know that's what feels so great here at the pig is that it's you know part of these wider networks that are exploring these huge questions but also it's just a joy to be here it's a joy you know we've had a guy pitch up today who's uh you know touring Ireland and learning natural building skills around the place and nice. you know later on I'll go over and probably have a pint in the game of chess with him and catch up and maybe someone else will turn up and just this feeling yeah. of of living in a way that we actually want to live and yeah. opening the space for more other people to live in the way that they actually want to live right. um whatever that way is for you yeah. you know that strikes me as 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 the way forward far more than you know all the intellectual debates about you know what percentage of the world needs to be farmland or whatever right yeah no i i, I agree prefiguring the future should be fun it shouldn't yeah. it shouldn't feel like this this burden that we have to bear it should actually be joyful and fun and i think inherently it is and that's that's very nice that 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 that, is, that seems to be aligned um yeah, I mean, if it's not fun, it's not sustainable ultimately because That's, you're going to get exhausted yeah. and collapse. <laughs> right. Yeah, and in a lot of other pathologies will develop as well. So yeah, I agree. Well, all right, man. This has been this has been great. Um, until next time, until the next conversation or the next you know venue we run into each other, or the next way we collaborate. Um, this has been great, and thank you for uh, for coming on. And let's do this again. Yep. Until the time, yeah. my friend. All right, John. Take care. Bye.